It's difficult to understand Baroque art without understanding the Catholic Counter-Reformation. Even in countries that weren't necessarily Catholic by the time the struggles between the Catholics and the Protestants had ceased, even those countries and even those artists are still picking up on some of the trends that were really set forth by the Catholic artists in Italy at the beginning of the Catholic Counter-Reformation. And this is really what spawns the style that we call Baroque art today. So let's give some basic kind of information so you can kind of understand exactly what's happening to lead us into this new artistic movement. First, we need to understand that in the southern parts of Europe during the Baroque, this was a time of incredible instability. There are a number of intense political struggles that almost embody the entirety of Europe. We have the 80 Years War and the 30 Years War, for instance, both of which have a lot of religious motivations behind them. And not only is this a time of political change and um, instability, but it's also a change of ideas, of identities. European people had been united by a Catholic a sense of identity and a Catholic sense of unity since the time of Charlemagne. Once the Protestant Reformation hits, that really changes in a very strident way. Neighbors are not content to live and let live, but instead uh, people really felt motivated to fight even to the death over these religious kinds of beliefs and struggles. So this was a time of an incredible amount of chaos, an incredible amount of uh, fighting, an incredible amount of suffering, all down to these kinds of religious struggles. So what we have is we have a Catholic church then that is bleeding members, that is losing members to these Protestant leaders and Protestant churches that are emerging, uh, especially in that second quarter of the 16th century. And the Catholic Church knows it needs to do something to stop the, the loss of membership and also to kind of restore its reputation as a powerful institution throughout Europe. So what it does is it launches the Catholic Counter-Reformation it has a few tools that it uses. It uses the Jesuits, which were an order of monks founded by St. Ignatius. Uh, it uses also the Inquisition. And what's most important for us as we discuss the trends in art is the Catholic Counter-Reformation also uses the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent is actually a series of meetings, even though its name makes it sound like it's only one large meeting. It happens uh, in the middle of the 16th century over a period of roughly 20 years, where leading Catholic officials meet together to discuss all of these different Protestant complaints, and they want to argue against why these Protestant complaints are invalid. So they go through kind of line by line almost and talk about all of them. One of the ways that Protestants differed from Catholics were in their opinions towards art. Protestant leaders did not feel that art should be a crucial tool for religious use and religious function. Instead, they advocated that believers should read their Bibles themselves. Uh, and for the Catholics, this was something that was just unthinkable. Catholics then decide to address this new approach to art that the Protestants had laid forth. And what they're going to do in the Council of Trent when they talk about art is they're going to start by saying that artworks had been an important tool for teaching people the doctrines of Christianity since the very first kind of early days of the Christian church. And so they really felt that this was a long-standing tradition that had an incredible value for Catholicism and they wanted art to continue to remain essential teaching tool. And that is one of the first things that the Council of Trent lays out, that art should be didactic. Art should be for teaching the people. To go along with that, it's not a very useful teaching tool if the artworks are hard to understand. So the Council of Trent also says that they want artworks to be understandable and relatable. They really felt that art should continue to do these types of things, even though the Protestants had challenged the role of art. And we have to understand that the Protestants were really intense in their opposition to art for religious purposes. Uh, and there was a moment in the 1560s, especially where we had iconoclastic riots and Protestants 
defaced many works of art in churches, removed many works of art in churches, destroyed many works of art in churches as a way to kind of make their strong opinions about religious imagery known. Given that, it's easy to understand why the Catholics felt the need to kind of reaffirm the role of art and its use in Catholic practice. It's also easy to understand why the Catholic Council of Trent advocated that art should be understandable and relatable when we remember that the Mannerist movement was the movement that preceded the Baroque. Mannerism was known for being a little bit more obscure in its references and in having stories that were a little bit confusing or hard to understand. And so for the general Catholic population coming into the church and looking at a Mannerist work of art, it wasn't always as successful as a teaching tool because it was hard to understand. And if we look at this work on the left by Parmigianino, you can see there are some kind of uh, ambiguities here. There's a column there that doesn't hold anything up. There's a very small figure that's out of scale in the back and proportion. There's some other kinds of elements within this work that bring, up to, uh, bring to our minds a lot of questions rather than offering a clear religious narrative. If we contrast that with Caravaggio's work on the right, you can see the story here is immediately apparent. People can understand what's happening and even identify the moment in the narrative that's shown here by Caravaggio. So this Baroque work on the right then is easy to understand. It is easy to relate to us because it makes sense. And that's what the Catholic Council of Trent really wants art to do. In addition to art continuing to be a teaching tool and also being very understandable and relatable, the Catholic Council of Trent also wants artworks to inspire belief and piety. They really want these artworks to use emotion, especially to stir up the belief um, of the viewers as they look at the work. It's part of a spiritual campaign that was led by Pope Sixtus V and his successor, Pope Paul V, where they really encouraged and promoted art that should be dramatic and spiritually moving and spiritually involving. So that when viewers saw these works of art, they left feeling like they had a stronger belief in Catholic doctrines and in the Catholic Church. The Council of Trent also advocated that art should focus on Christ, Mary, and the saints. Uh, they wanted especially to focus on the fact that Mary and the saints were intercessors, because that's something that the Protestants challenged, right? The Protestants said, no, these are just good believers. They aren't necessarily uh, intercessors. The Catholics wanted to continue to focus on that role of the saints as intercessors. And they also wanted to focus on Christ and Mary and the saints as examples of faith in the face of challenges. This is not an easy time to be a Catholic during the Protestant uh, Reformation and the Catholic Counter-Reformation. This is not an easy time to stay true to your faith. Uh, there's a lot of suffering that happens on, on both sides of the issues as people suffer for their faith. And so when the Catholic Council of Trent is talking about focusing on Christ and Mary and the saints, they want people to be inspired by the examples uh, that they see within these holy figures. They also want Christ, Mary, and the saints to be shown in times of suffering. And there's actually a parallel with the contemporary literature of the time. It's something that we see in St. Ignatius's text, Spiritual Exercises. This was first published in 1548, and this was a text that encouraged Catholics to increase their spirituality through different religious practices. One of the things that they could do was contemplate on the suffering of Christ and Mary and the saints and different events that brought suffering uh, and tragedy into their lives. And by doing that, what they were supposed to, what Catholics were supposed to bring away from those contemplations was an understanding that this suffering was a gift from God and it was an expression of God's love and that these were examples of faith in times of trial. So we see a lot of art that reflects this emphasis on suffering. Uh, that's what made these saints and holy uh, individuals special. It also shows them to be examples of staying true to the Catholic faith, even when it's difficult. The Catholic Council of Trent also wants art to support the teachings of the Council of Trent. So these different doctrines that they're addressing um, in terms of the complaints of Protestantism, like the saints that we've already mentioned, or like transubstantiation, the Protestants felt that the sacrament was symbolic, and for the Catholics, they felt like it was a literal miracle known as transubstantiation. And so this was a point of difference in the doctrine between the two faiths. And so the Council of Trent really wanted art whenever it could to support 
this kind of idea or to support the saints or to support any kinds of doctrines it was setting forth that separated Catholic belief from Protestant belief. So we see a lot of artworks that focus on telling the stories of the saints and making the the saints feel like they were actual real people. We look at these works of art and we feel uh, carried away by the illusion in the works of art and we feel that there's no possible way that this wasn't a real person who experienced these real events. And what we are supposed to do then as viewers in the Catholic Counter-Reformation is to feel our testimony of these saints be strengthened because of the way that they are portrayed. And lastly, the Catholic Council of Trent really wants art to encourage people to return to the Catholic Church as we've been talking with all these different aspects. And also it wants art to glorify the Catholic Church. This is a time when the reputation of the Catholic Church has been lessened and they would really like to see art and architecture propagandically supporting Catholic prominence and Catholic power. We see so many works of architecture constructed during the Baroque, especially in Rome, that are statements of power and prestige and dominance on the part of the Catholic Church. Uh, We see so many works of art that are decorating the churches that are constructed during the Baroque and are sending out spiritually uplifting kinds of messages that also support the power uh, and the place of the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church really needs that type of propaganda. It is a struggling power structure. Uh, The monarchy is also struggling at this point in time, and art is definitely used to support their cause as well. Uh, We'll talk about that with other videos, but what we need to understand here is that all of these trends and all of these requests that the Catholic Council of Trent makes, artists begin to follow this advice. Artists begin to incorporate all of these elements into their work. They move away from mannerist tendencies and they move into an artistic style that's incredibly moving, incredibly emotional, incredibly inspiring, easy to relate to through illusion and really heavy in terms of Catholic content.